golden rule Thank you. We're blessed to have such wonderful talent here at the Fountains. It is great to see all of you out here. I see a lot of faces returning from their summers at their other places of residence, and we're glad to see you back. Also, everyone should note you are sitting on new chairs. So round of applause for trustees, <laughs> led in much part by Jim. So we thank you, Jim. We are appreciating these chairs this morning. Um, also, there are red pads on the end of each aisle. If you want to pick that up and put some information about yourself in there, that would be great. It helps us to know who's here and kind of reach out to you if you're just visiting. And um, if you have any questions about the fountains, you can put them in on here and someone will contact you. Also want to um, point some attention to the prayer shawl table, which is over here to my left. Um, those prayer shawls are for the taking. Our prayer shawl group meets and they knit those shawls and therefore anyone who you think might uh, could benefit from having a prayer shawl. So if that is something that works for you, please stop by that table. Also at times we have blessing bags over there. That table is empty 
at the moment, but the goods are here and a group is gathering to put them together. So hopefully by next week, there'll be some bags on that table for you to pick up as well. Another ministry here at the fountains. Um, I'm gonna ask Dee Dee to come up and is that the way we said we do it? You do first and then Dee Dee will have David come up. We're going to be doing the feeding of the 110 guys at the New Leaf Center uh, in Mesa on Halloween night. So we are going to dress up in a costume or a mask or just some kind of little costume, but we still need a little bit of help. So check your schedule. We still need a little bit of help with the ground beef. We need some servers, cookies, and uh, always we can use money to purchase the things that, like buns and pickles and things that we can't make. So the sign-up sheet is in the back. Please see me if you would like to uh, sign up and go with us. We always have a great time. And for the man who needs no introduction. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> good morning. It's so good to see some of you back from the hinterlands, wherever that might be. Great to have you. Uh, just wanted to uh, invite you to make sure to look at your e-streams that comes each week uh, for all of the details on things that are coming up, like serving at New Leaf, etc. But just also want to let you know about our next Living the Questions webinar, which is coming up starting a week from Thursday. Uh, that is a limited registration because it's a Zoom event and we don't want to have too many people and we're already bumping up against 40. So we want to make sure that if you're interested in joining that you get on board. We've got people from the fountains, we've got people from all over the country and we had our first registration from England uh, this week. So uh, if you're interested in uh, for many of you would be finishing up the Borg class because we started it immediately pre-pandemic. And I think we got through two or three sessions before we had to bring that to an end. So uh, check out, go to livingthequestions.com and you can register there and you'll get all the information for how you hook up with the Zoom class. Uh, just wanted to uh, take a few minutes and express how excited I am to have our new bishop with you, with us, and uh, share a little bit about his background. Um, bishop Carlo was born and raised in the Philippines, uh, where he grew up in his local United Methodist Church. Um, and after earning a bachelor's degree in mathematics at the university, you laugh. I barely made it. Okay, all right. I like, I like to hear that. They know me in math. I mean, <laughs> like there are 300 people here today, right? I mean, that's, that's my math. So um, at the University of the Philippines, and then he did a brief stint, I like this, as a script writer, anchor, and voiceover talent for local TV stations. So uh, meanwhile, he was managing the databases for his own local bishop while he was finishing his equivalent of the MBA in the Philippines. Uh, he then attended Wesley Divinity School, where he finished his Master of Divinity. If you're counting, that's two master's degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and he graduated magna cum laude. So, mm, yes. He then served, and you're going to have to help me pronounce this. Yeah. Baguio? Yes. Baguio City, First United Methodist Church, which was not only his first appointment, but it's the church that he grew up in and that sent you off to school and seminary and everything. So first as associate pastor and then as senior pastor. But he was too good. So they bumped him upstairs to be the assistant to the bishop of the Philippines, uh, where soon after he answered the call to go uh, to serve in the Alaska Missionary Conference, where he served as a pastor, then as director of connectional ministries for the conference, eventually dean of the cabinet, and then assistant to the bishop of the Alaska Conference. Um, over the years, looking at the list, it's hard to imagine. Carlo has served on too many general boards and agencies to even begin to list, which uh, as member and as chair, which puts him above bishop and kind of at saint level <laughs> to serve at all of these, to put up with all of these meetings, you know. Uh, bishop Carlo is married to Zoraida, who is a CPA. Uh, they are the proud parents of Caleb and Titus. And why are they proud? Mm -hmm. Why are they proud? I ask you, why are they proud? B 
because both Caleb and Titus are saxophone players. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, that, yes, yes. So we, we tried to, you know, do the overkill on saxophones today. So. Um, Carlo is a long distance runner. And over the last 10 years, he has run in everything from 10 Ks to ultra marathons. And while he enjoys cycling, photography, and hiking, I have it on good authority that his absolute favorite thing in the whole wide world is being the new bishop of the Desert Southwest Conference. <laughs> Friends, welcome Bishop Carlo to the fountains. Thank you. So now that we've heard a little bit about Bishop Carlo and we'll hear more about him in his message this morning, uh, yesterday was also our annual charge conference where our district superintendent, Melissa Reinders, was here to do the business of the church. But as part of my pastor's report to the church, uh, we have a slideshow. And so we thought we would show you and also Bishop Carlos some of what we've done in the last uh, 12 months so you can get an idea of who we are. So let's see what we've got.
As one former district superintendent said years ago, the Fountains is a church that punches above its weight class. Uh, so when I look at that, I am reminded of how fortunate I am and how glad I am to be in ministry with you all. And I hope you guys are happy to be in ministry with one another because you guys do great work. So let's hear it for yourselves for a wonderful year. And with that being said, I invite you to stand, and I have to really say this now because Denise, I'll tell you more about that later, has broken her leg. So stand as you are able, uh, and let's join together in our call to celebration you'll find on the screen. Love is creative and redemptive. Love builds up and unites. Hate tears down and destroys. Physical force can repress, restrain, coerce, destroy. But it cannot create and organize anything permanent. Only love can do that. Understanding. Goodwill. Yes, love. Even for one's enemies. Love is the solution. Let's sing. Please stay standing as we state our mission. 
As followers of Jesus, we put love first. Please be seated. We come now to a time of centering ourselves and opening our hearts to the presence of the Spirit. Let's prepare ourselves for a time of quiet openness. Well, I guess I have to say, as a way of introduction to prayer, that I was alerted today by Wisconsin people that today is National Cheese Curd Day. So uh, we'll be in prayer for that. Um, but we also just want to keep in prayer um, Denise, who fell off a ladder. Uh, just note to all of us. Um, ladder buddies that we learn <laughs> yeah. when we're at Sierra Service Project, ladder buddies. Um, but it's an extremely weirdly broken leg. It just, you leave it to Denise to not do anything halfway. And so she's still waiting for an appointment tomorrow to determine whether it's going to require surgery. So uh, we'll want to be keeping her in our prayers. And please, um, if there's anything you can do to uh, reach out to Denise uh, by way of support or feeding or whatever, uh, I'm sure that that would be um, much appreciated. Also, David Onkstad in uh, Minnesota came through his procedure very well this week. David and Melva are some of our seasonal visitors, and David uh, had knee surgery, knee replacement surgery, which went uh, kind of Sally, Sally Lloyd-like, um, which got an infection and needed to be completely redone. So uh, the good news is that he feels better than he's felt in months, and recovering well. So we'll want to keep David in our prayers. Also, the obvious. Um, many of you have written to me or asked me about what we might do or say or even begin to take action on the events that have occurred in Israel and Gaza over the last week. Um, I have been at a loss as to what to say. There is no simple solution. Um, having spent time in the West Bank and toured um, Palestinian refugee camps in Jordan, um, I see what they have been going through for generations. It's not a simple solution. Um, seeing the response that the Israeli government has chosen to take against the people of Gaza who have nothing to do with Hamas. They are as innocent as we are in being caught up in this situation and furthermore have been in many ways oppressed in ways that we cannot even imagine for generations. Um, I was moved to hear us to see a clip with Golda Meir, right? No conservative or no liberal, crazy, left-leaning, crazy person, right? And she said, look, from 1929 to 1948, I carried a Palestinian passport, right? The prime minister of Israel. She said, I am a Palestinian. And until we get that through our collective heads, that Palestine has been there for a lot longer <laughs> than any people that are trying to make a solution right now seem to realize we're not going to get anywhere. And I've been moved this week by interviews with, with Jewish citizens who have loved ones who have been massacred or taken as hostages and to a person. Every one of them has said, I am heartbroken and I am angry. But please do not do the kind of vengeance that I see being warmed up against the Palestinians in my name, because there is nothing that is going to get us towards peace if we continue to lash out at one another. Um, this is the kind of thing where, you know, I've said it to you guys before, was Jesus just wrong? Was he naive? when he said to love our enemies? Was he? I mean, that's what we have to wrestle with right now. And there's no simple solution to that. So my invitation to all of you is to hug your loved ones. Let them know 
how important they are for you because none of us know when anything like this might happen at the last minute. But also reach out to your Jewish and your Muslim friends and let them know that with them you are flummoxed as to what to do and that we stand by to help in any way we can if in no other way than to be witnesses to that call on Jesus, of Jesus on our lives, to put love first, to love our enemies. That's with no exceptions. What does that look like in a moment like this? What does that look like? I don't have an answer. Maybe the bishop does. <laughs> we are all in this difficult situation together. And as one of, the, one of the survivors of the massacre at the, at the uh, concert said, we have to put the generational hatred aside. What we have to look at is right now, the human beings in front of us, to see them as human beings. And when we are able to do that, despite our differences, we'll be well on our way to doing what needs to be done. Amen? Amen. All right, so let's take a moment and uh, enter into a time of prayer. Uh, we chose a centering song today that is from uh, Desmond Tutu that was put to music by John Bell um, that really says what I think needs to be said that goodness is stronger than evil. So let's take a moment. If you're comfortable putting your feet flat on the floor, I encourage you to do that, maybe scooching back in your seat. And I like to open my palms as a sign of being receptive to the spirit. Maybe you can hold the hand of a loved one or fold your hands, whatever helps you get ready for this time of quiet and openness. As we breathe in, and breathe out. Center into this moment, this time of quiet. And we can be especially open to the movement of the Spirit in this place. As we join together in singing our centering song, the words of which you'll find on the screen. Let's sing. Goodness is stronger than evil. Love is stronger than hate. Light is stronger than darkness. Life is stronger than death. Let's sing that a cappella right now. Let's sing that. Goodness is stronger than evil. Love is stronger than hate. Light is stronger than darkness. Life is stronger than death. Let's continue with our unison act of awareness you'll find on the screen. Let's pray. Companion of the lonely, binder of wounds, seeker of lost souls, friend of the poor, source of all that is, forgiver of sins, voice of the voiceless, counselor of the confused, shelter from the storm, creator of heaven and earth. In every aspect of our lives, we seek to honor that healing movement, that mystery, which wells up from the depths of who we are. We give thanks for the gifts of life and love and long for the spark of divine love to grow within us, that through our lives, Others will come to know the grace, courage, and love that we've come to know 
in the life and call of Jesus on our lives. This is our prayer. And as we pause in this time of quiet, one that over the course of this week has been filled with images of such horror and such angst and anger and confusion, it's hard to take it in. And it's at times like these when we need to depend on one another to be reminded that the call that we've answered to be followers of Jesus is, is not just a sunshine and rainbows call, but it's a call that brings us to the precipice of crises and conflicts that are generations long, that people who are far smarter and holier and with more influence than we will ever have have struggled with these problems, with these challenges, and yet here we are. And so as we strive to not be hard on ourselves for not having a simple solution, let us not be touched by the excuse of apathy so that we might just throw up our hands in frustration, but know that it is exactly at moments like this when we are God's hands and feet, God's eyes and ears and hearts, that we have been called to make a difference in the world, to, as our Jewish brothers and sisters say, to tikkun olam, to heal the world. And as our Muslim brothers and, say, brothers and sisters say, inshallah, if it be God's will, may we be part of whatever kind of solution can be made to happen. May it start with us in our relationships with our lives as full of uncertainty and with all of our shortcomings and shortfalls, remind us of the way the Spirit has worked in our lives in the past, and that in so many ways we can only see the Spirit at work in hindsight and marvel and so let us not be those who would be tempted to give up, to give in to violence and vengeance, but to see one another as vessels, the Holy Spirit, to remind ourselves that every person has within them the spark of the Spirit of Christ. So in these difficult days ahead, may we still the chatter in our minds and set aside any knee-jerk reactions so that we might be open to the guidance of the Spirit. And as individuals and as a community, we might get a sense of a way forward that is full of grace, compassion, forgiveness, and hope. 
in this time of quiet. We open our hearts and minds so that we might have a glimpse of the Spirit's presence here and now. May we be open, receptive, and respond with love. We offer this time of quiet openness, bringing our whole selves as we join together in singing the prayer that Jesus taught his first followers to pray. to invite Ray up to share a little bit about our SAWS ministry. And here's the clicker, Ray, if you want to move through the slides. Thank you. Yeah. I've got too many things in my hands. Oh. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm going to point out these first before I get started. There's some uh, pieces of paper coming around that have a uh, one of the designs for a, uh, a ramp that we just finished building yesterday. Well, we need to finish the UAs and a few other things, but uh, we did uh, quite a bit of it, and you can see on the picture that's coming around what, that, what those look like. Um, when uh, when, when uh, David asked me to speak, I said, well, you know, he's told me two to three minutes, and, and I said, wait a second, you know that I used to be a, a preacher. One minute, Ray. One minute. <laughs> so, so I made a few notes. But, notes. yeah. Uh, <laughs> so you can play, the, play those later. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. So I, I'm really excited about the SAWS ministry. Uh, we have uh, David James, who is the CEO of uh, of the, Jane, of, the, of the James Saws Ministry, of the <laughs> Saws Ministry Southwest, and so he's part of our membership. Uh, there's Larry back there that tries his best to corral us into doing a good job, and, and uh, Jim, and, and uh, uh, oh boy, anyway, several people who have worked on, on these ramps. The, the picture up here is uh, the, it's actually not the first one, uh, I thought there was one more. Anyway, the, the, it all st okay, you're right. The, the, it all starts by a, a group of people going and doing a site survey. So we do a site survey, we drop some little pictures, and, and then we send them to uh, uh, Rick Drapilla, who actually draws these plans up that you have that are going around. And then we build the ramps here on the, in our shop in the back that, that uh, we'd love to give you a little tour of later. And then, the, then we go out and we start 
building them. I mean, installing them after we uh, go there. Uh, luckily, Larry has a, a summer home in Flagstaff where we can stay overnight and then do a build the next day, which is very, very convenient as long as we bring the right food. Uh, the, this is a ramp up on the Hopi Nation, uh, just, beside, just, just below, uh, help me out, um, uh, Mesa 2? Yeah. Yeah, Second Mesa, just below Second Mesa. And that's the, basically the finished product. That's what it looks like when we're done. This is uh, Bill and I, we went in June to do a site survey. So the, the order's a little off. But this site survey, and this is in Mesa, uh, and we uh, had to remove a few things. And this is the final product uh, that we were able to get to. We don't have the picture that, well, the picture in the upper left in this, uh, has Khalif, who actually dropped by the site and was able to, uh, he never picked up a, a drill, so we, we, we have to work on that, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll bring one with us to Atlanta in November, so <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, those are some of the ramps and platforms that are in the shop. Those are, that's a picture of the shop, which is uh, real exciting that, that we have that. So anyway, I appreciate all the support that we get from the congregation. We keep moving forward. Uh, uh, hashtag we are was going to wear my T-shirt today. But, uh, and so I, I appreciate your help. And any donations of time, energy, prayers, and uh, if you want to throw us a few dollars, that's okay too. So <laughs> thank you for your time. Thank you. At the Fountains, we embrace a community where seekers, skeptics, and followers of Jesus collaborate to create a more just and peaceful world. One of the ways that we express our gratitude for the abundant gifts of life is through financial support of the Fountains. To contribute, you can simply drop your offering off into one of the ceramic pigs that are located at the exits. Alternatively, you can give electronically by using the QR code that's displayed on the screen or by accessing the links that are provided in our weekly eStreams newsletter. May we give with joy knowing that we are actively living out Jesus' calling on our lives. And we thank you for your generous support. about complex things a safe place to question to think and to grow we challenge ourselves to begin the first put the first we put the We choose to serve, giving help to those in need. By working together, we strive to provide both grace and dignity. The first, put the first, we put love first here at the fountain. We put the best here at the fountain. 
Yeah. The first, put the first. We put the first here at the fountains. <laughs> Let's stand and sing. Our words of wisdom this morning come from Corinthians 13, and this is the voice adaptation. What if I speak in the most elegant languages of people or in the exotic languages of the heavenly messengers, but I live without love? Well then, anything I say is like the clanging of brass or a clashing cymbal. What if I have the gift of prophecy and bluff and blessed with knowledge and insight to all the mysteries? Or what if my faith is strong enough to scoop a mountain from its bedrock, yet I live without love? If so, I am nothing. I could give all that I have to feed the poor, I could surrender my body to be burned as a martyr, but if I do not live in love, I gain nothing by my selfless acts. Love is patient, love is kind, love isn't envious, it doesn't boast, brag, or strut about. There's no arrogance in love. It's never rude, crude, or indecent. It's not self-absorbed. Love isn't easily upset. Love doesn't tally wrongs or celebrate injustice. But truth, yes, truth is love's delight. Love puts up with anything and everything that comes along. It trusts, hopes, and endures no matter what. Love will never become obsolete. As for prophecies, they won't last. Those who speak in tongues will become silent, and the gift of knowledge will no longer be needed. Gifts of knowledge and prophecy are partial at best. But when the perfection and fullness of God's reign arrives, all the incomplete fragments will vanish. When I was a child, I spoke, thought, and reasoned in childlike ways. But when I became an adult, I left my childish ways behind. For now, we can only see a dim and blurry picture of things, as when we stare into a mist. I realize that everything I know is only part of the big picture. But one day, we will see clearly, face to face. In that day, we will be fully known just as if we have been wholly known by God. But for now, faith, hope, and love remain. These three virtues must characterize our lives, and the greatest of these is love. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Good morning, fountains. Good morning. Good morning. It's so good to be here. It's so good to be here. I want to thank Reverend David for the invitation to, to, to preach and to, to worship with you this morning. I, I enjoyed the drive. I, I love to drive. And so just, and, and to see hills, to see <laughs> undulations is, is a gift. I grew up in the mountains of Northern Philippines. And so um, my, my happy place, my soul place is, is in the mountains. And so it's, it's a blessing to be here. Um, one of the challenges of guest preaching, and, and I mean, truth be told, when, when, when David invited me, he said, pick a date and, and we'll, <laughs> we'll clear the Red Sea. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll create the schedule. And uh, it turns out this, this day worked out. Well, actually, it didn't anymore because... <laughs> um, my, my, my wife, Raddy, and our son, Titus, would have been with me today, except Titus has a swim meet today. And so uh, he, they're, they're out there. And uh, I, I was with them yesterday, though, so uh, no worries about that. It, it was kind of cool. He was doing backstroke 
um, while the eclipse <laughs> was ongoing. So that was kind of a cool thing. So uh, one of the challenges of guest preaching is, is, is doing so while, while a church is in the midst of a, a sermon series, right? Like, uh, it, it's like going to commercial after a scene that's almost reaching the climax. <laughs> Don't you hate it when that happens, right? Or, or you're following this, this really good uh, series on TV. Uh, who watches <laughs> TV anyway? I mean, you, we binge watch. But if, if you're following a new series that weekly a new episode comes out, and then you tune in and it's not there, and you get a rerun or another show. I mean, it, it's kind of like that. So, <laughs> I mean, I, I know you, you all had a break last Sunday with, with Blessing of the Animals. But friends, you're, you're really talking about some important stuff in, in your series about getting on with the message. I mean, you're talking about reclaiming the social justice imperative. You're talking about the, the nonviolence imperative in resisting white supremacy, Christian nationalism, and racism. You're talking about reproductive rights and affirming women's moral agency. You're talking about the Christian case against capital punishment. You're talking about the biblical case for seeking economic justice. The, the challenge of being church in a digital world, fixing our national immigration policy, confronting apartheid in modern Israel. I mean, these are good stuff you're talking about. So what do you need me for? <laughs> I mean, seriously, what, what, what else? For for backup, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Comic relief, more more like it. <laughs> and so, as as I come to you today, friends, I do not come to you as the messenger from on high, because I'm not. I am a fellow traveler on the journey. I, I may have this. <laughs> who's that young guy? <laughs> I may have this fancy title, bishop. But that, what that really means is I get to do the administrative, political, financial work so that you all are freed up to do the exciting, sexy work of ministry. <laughs> Amen? Amen? And so as I reflected on these topics that you've been talking about, and as I sort of worked my way through your website and tried to learn your story and learned about your ministries and the, the awesome things that you are all about as the fountains. I thought I'd simply ask the question to borrow words from the great Tina Turner. What's love got to do with it? Your mission statement is we put love first. I love it. Now, how is that lived out? What's love got to do with all of these things that you all are learning about? What's love got to do with all of these things that you are all about in ministry as the expression of Jesus Christ in this place? Our text today is usually read at weddings, right? Any one of you kind of think, oh, there's a wedding today? 1 <laughs> Corinthians 13? It, it is fondly called the, the love chapter. It is used to remind couples of what is, what love is, and what love is not. It's like a list of do's and don'ts, if you may, of a successful marriage or, or the Ten Commandments of couples. Now, nothing wrong with that. But we have to remember that Paul wrote this passage not to a young couple getting married, or a couple getting married, but Paul wrote this to a church that he planted, a three-year-old church. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't disagree with the use of this passage for weddings, and I've used it for weddings that I've done, and it was even read at our wedding. What I'm trying to say is this passage 
finds broader and deeper meaning in the life of the church, in the life of a congregation. See, the church in Corinth had its issues. I mean, what church doesn't, right? It had its issues. It has its issues of identity and of unity. See, Corinth was a, was a gathering place. It was a, I hate to use the term melting pot, because when, when it's a melting pot, you kind of lose your identity. But when it's a gathering place, you keep your identity. But it, 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 that comes with challenges. So it, it, it was a, a pluralistic society with, with, with a lot of uh, foreigners and travelers bringing their culture and their religion and their ways of life. And that naturally, you know, found its way, the conflicts that that bred found its way in the church. They had issues of identity, unity, hierarchy, control. Should, should women be, should younger people be? And what, what is the role of husbands to wives and et cetera? I mean, they had these, con and, and what about the Jews and the Gentiles? And they, they had all of these kind of power dynamics within uh, their faith community. And, and they struggled with this, they, with their issues, as they struggled to grow their witness in the town of Corinth. In the previous chapter, 1 Corinthians 12, Paul was reminding them that they were one body, made up of many members, differently gifted, differently abled, and each one important, each one a part of the body. And then he says, what if I speak in the most elegant languages of people or in the exotic languages of the heavenly messengers, but I live without love? Well, then anything I say is like the clanging of brass or a crashing cymbal. Let's, let's do a crashing cymbal right there. Well, see, that's pleasant. <laughs> a crash is when you drop the symbol, and it's, it's just, yeah, there you go. Yeah. What if I have the gift of prophecy? I'm blessed uh, with knowledge and insight to all the mysteries, or, or what if my faith is strong enough to scoop a mountain from its bedrock, yet I live without love? If so, I am nothing. I could give all that I have to feed the poor. I could surrender my body to be burned as a martyr. But if I do not love, I gain nothing by my selfless acts. See, Paul is saying, you all are one body, Corinth. You all are one body. And, and, and you all are good at what you do. Each one of you has a gift. And you all are good at what you do. All of you. Each one of you is good at what they do and what they're gifted at. But you see, you may be so good at what you do. You may be so good with your gift, but if you don't do it in love, then it is nothing. See, friends, love has got everything to do with it. Love has got everything to do with being church. Love has got everything to do with our witness in the world. That is why we put love first. Otherwise, we could be just a secular organization, a social service organization. In our retreat this past summer, my cabinet and I discerned carefully how God was calling us to lead during this time in the life of our church and our world. I mean, we, we find ourselves in the sort of intersection of, of, of different pandemics and, and, and different um, social ills, if you may. And we ask the question, how, how, how is God calling us to lead during this time? And we discern that we are going to lead in love. There will be no fancy, carefully worded vision and mission statements. 
there will be no elaborate strategic plans. That will come later, much later. For now, we will just love. We will love the people in the desert Southwest and beyond. And it is our hope that in our growing in love together, we would all together discern a vision of what God is calling us to do. So you will hear a common message for us, from us, love, simple. Now I know that Reverend Khalif was here a couple of weeks ago and he talked about love. Reverend Melissa was here yesterday. I'm sure she talked about love. So this won't be new to some of you or to most of you, but I'll share it anyway so that it sticks. Uh, you heard that I have a background in communication and studies show that you have to communicate something seven times in seven different ways before it sticks. So, so putting it in the bulletin doesn't cut it. <laughs> putting it on the website, that's just two. Seven times in seven, seven different ways. So here goes. We're here to love. And what does that mean to us? L stands for listening to each other's stories. What's your story? What's your story? I mean, uh, Reverend David shared a little bit about my story today. But that's not the whole me. Uh, have you ever been in a meeting uh, with uh, Native Americans? Anyone here? It's beautiful, right? It's scheduled for uh, maybe half a day. In the first two hours, what do you do? Wait for everybody to arrive. Wait for everybody to arrive and just tell stories. You just tell stories about where you've been and who you're related to and who's your mom and who passed away and who had a birthday and who got married. And by the end of the gathering time, however long that is, you're no longer strangers. You're not even just friends. You're practically relatives and family. Because you, you've made the intentional effort to do the connection. What's your story? That person that sits behind, be, behind you or beside you every Sunday, because I know you have assigned seating here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's their story? That person you park by every Sunday when you come to church, what's their story? That person you've come to church since the inception of this church 13 years ago. 13? No, to, 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 30, 30. Well, why did I get 13? This, this building was 13. All those years you've seen this person. What's their story? What's the story of the person who comes to your door for a hot meal or cool shelter during the summer? What's the story of the young man holding a cardboard sign at the intersection on your drive to church? What's the story of your office mate or your golf buddy who suddenly, out of the blue, lashed out on you in anger. What's their story? It's so important to judge people by what little we know of them. And if we are to love, we need to begin by learning each one's stories. There's a beautiful TED Talk by Chimamanda Adichie, a, a novelist, a Nigerian novelist, who talks about the danger of a single story, of how we, we pigeonhole and we um, stereotype people by, by just that little thing that we know about them. What we, would you have thought of me if it wasn't announced that the bishop was coming I came in a t-shirt, jeans, flip-flops, and had tattoos on me. 
great socks. <laughs> no great socks. <laughs> like, you would form a different picture, opinion of me. And, I, and this isn't a judgment of you. This is a judgment of human nature. That we have a danger of creating a single story from what little we know. Oh, you were born in the Philippines? Your, your English is so good. Did you, come, did, did you go to school here in the U.S.? Actually, I didn't. My whole education was in the Philippines. What is your story in your mind about Filipinos and how they speak English? See, friends, in this season of love, I invite us to listen to each other's stories and to be open. And as we listen to each other's stories, as we think about loving each other and the stories that we bring, we need to be, oh, open to change. When we love, we need to be open to the change that love's, love brings to us. As we learn about what it means to live as followers of Jesus, as, as you all go through this series that really challenges not just your perspectives, but what what you think, what you believe Jesus is calling you to do during this time, given the situation, you, will, you and I will be challenged to be open to change. And so ask the question, what is it in your heart of hearts that needs to change? And how can you begin the steps toward making that change? I mean, just, uh, you, you all probably were streaming <laughs> before the pandemic, but what does it look like? What, what, what does it even mean to have a congregation where half of the people are worshiping with us online and asynchronously, which means they're not sitting in their couches or on their boats or wherever around the world during this time. They might be joining us tomorrow or midweek or, or whenever during the week. What does it mean to be at the body of Christ? It stretches. It, it stretches our imagination. It stretches how we think of things. And we need to be open to that change in the name of love. Otherwise, it's going to fray our relationships and how we work together. As we learn about each other's stories, we will realize how diverse we are. And so the V in love is value diversity. I love the second creation account in Genesis, where it talks about God creating this and that, and, and the variety of, of, of that spectrum that, that, that God creates each day. And at the end of each day, God looks at the variety, the diversity, and says, it's good, right? Day in and day out, God creates a spectrum. And by the way, sixth day, God creates humans. And God creates, as, as the scripture says, man and woman. But if you look at the literary uh, design, every day God creates a spectrum, right? And so we have to read day six in the context of the five previous days. And so when God creates humans, God creates a spectrum. Think about that. A sermon for another day. <laughs> but God looks at the diversity and says it's good. And God looks at the complete creation after the end of day six, and, it's, and God says, it's very good. What does it look like? What does it mean like to look at the diverse created order with the different stories, the different backgrounds, different persuasions and politics and idiosyncrasies and say it's good, it's very good. And of course, as we value diversity, 
then we need to talk about expanding the table. There's a commercial, and if I, I was planning it right, I should have sent the, the video for it to be shown, but there's a commercial in the early 90s, uh, Coca-Cola commercial, that, that showed this, this table. <laughs> and and they, they were drinking Coke, and, and the neighbors came and brought their table, and then it, they, they just added a table, added, 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 until the table kind of went around the world. I mean, it showed different countries expanding the table. I'll, maybe I'll send the video, and then you, you can uh, send it in your email and put it in the bulletin, so. <laughs> Except you have no bulletin, bulletin so. so. So E in love is, how do we embody belonging? Right? How, how do we expand the table to include everyone? And how do we move from inclusion to belonging? See, uh, inclusion is, is uh, or, or belong is where one truly feels that they belong instead of just being included. You get me? Inclusion is based on the premise that there is still a person in the position of privilege granting permission to include. Belonging means free access by everyone. How can we move in this diverse collection of different people with different stories that God calls good. How can we move from inclusion to belonging? We're called to love. We're called to listen to each other's stories, to be open to change, to value diversity, and to embody belonging. So in closing, I would say, friends, keep learning what you are learning. Keep doing what you are doing, the good that you are doing. Keep living out what you are called to live out. You're doing good stuff. Hear this from me as your bishop, you're doing good stuff. But please, please, do it in love. Do it in love. And it's not, for, for love's got everything to do with it. And it's not the squishy and sentimental kind of love. It is the love that is patient, the love that is kind, the love that isn't envious, doesn't boast, brag, or strut about. It is the love that has no arrogance, that's never rude or crude or inde indecent. The love that is not self-absorbed. Uh, Michael Curry, the, the prime bishop of, of the Episcopal Church in, here in the U.S., in his sermon at the wedding of uh, the royal wedding. <laughs> uh, yeah, Meghan Prince and Harry Prince Harry and Meghan. He said that, that the opposite of love isn't hatred. The, the opposite of love is selfishness. Is, is not focusing on others, but focusing on oneself. So love that is not self-absorbed, the love that isn't easily upset, the love that doesn't tally wrongs or celebrate injustice, but delights in the truth. It isn't a sentimental kind of love. It is the love that puts up with everything and everything that comes along. It is the love that trusts, hopes, and endures no matter what. It is the love that will never become obsolete. Jesus was asked by a lawyer, a, a scholar, teacher, what is the greatest commandment? What is the greatest commandment? What, what, what is life really all about? Is, is really what, what this person was asking. And without batting an eyelash, Jesus replies, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is just, it's just like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Do this, and you shall live. Do this, and you shall live. Fountains, keep doing what you're doing. 
and do all of these that you do all so well in love. Amen. Amen. You get to sing now. What yeah. love's got to do with it? <laughs> Sharon, come on. And Bishop Carlo, if you'd like to stay here for a second. Thank you for what... what What's I thought you were going to do, do a solo it? there. <laughs> yeah. No, you have to sing, Tina. All right. So uh, a couple of gifts. So Sharon? Yes. Hey, it's always been Bish in my house. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> I got it. We've, we have a blessing bag for you. We put these together um, with some frequency, and everybody who has the opportunity to drive around the valley picks up some and takes them out and gives them to people standing on street corners mm. with cardboard sides. All right. So that's for you. Thank and you. I hope you uh, enjoy giving that away. And this is a gift bag that we have for you with some goodies in it that we hope you will, you and your family will enjoy. I'm going to yeah, show one of the so. shirts. Of course, it's the shirts, all of our swag, mugs. Oh, nice. <laughs> Thank you. That'll look good on the next. Marathon. There you go. <laughs> all right. And mugs and all of that. Yeah, so there mugs, you go. Mugs and all, all kinds of fun things. Thank you so Thank much. you. Thank you so much. You. And we've, uh, we've asked the bishop to stay for a few minutes afterwards. We've got some amazing refreshments afterwards. And then uh, in a few minutes after we break for refreshments, we're going to come back to do a little Q&A so you can ask the bishop for definitive answers on what's happening with the United Methodist Church <laughs> globally, <laughs> right? Yeah, no pressure, yeah. no pressure. Yeah, so, yeah. hey, let's stand and sing. You might remember on the 10th anniversary of our becoming a reconciling uh, congregation, Amanda Eudes Kessler wrote us our own song. Uh, and if you didn't realize the offering was also original, uh, Donna and Richard wrote that for us for the fountain, so yay! So we're not that familiar with this song yet, so I encourage you to sing with as much gusto as you can muster, and we'll do it in honor of the fact that not only have we been 10 years a reconciling congregation, but this weekend is Tom Swetnam's 92nd birthday. So let's sing together. We will go out in love. love. We will go out and bring love to the world. We will go out in love. We Sing the refrain together, shall we? We will go out in love. We will go out and bring love to the world. We will go out in love. We will live God's love. Let's try verse four. Here we know we are empowered. Building up a world of care, agents of change, working for justice, practicing peace in hope and prayer, filled with compassion, called into action, striving to end the pain and fear. As we are healed, we heal others. This is the way. Let's hear it. We will go out in love. We will go out and bring love to the world. We will go out in love. We will live God's love. Bishop. There's
there's a Jesuit, so Roman Catholic scholar, uh, theologian, mystic uh, by the name, uh, Teilhard de Chardin. And he, he talked about the discovery of fire. It's, uh, the discovery of fire is so important to, to the life of humanity. Like you, you cooked your meals today, right, before you came and you drove your cars and all of that is fire based. And so the discovery of fire just, there wouldn't have been a bronze age or an iron age or whatever without fire. And then he talks about the discovery of love. That when humanity finally discovers what love is and is able to harness its power, it would have phenomenal, life-changing uh, effects larger than the discovery of fire. And so go forth, go out in love and discover that power. Harness it and share it with each one. Let's put love first, fountains. Let's put love first. Amen. So we invite you to stay for extra special refreshments this morning and then we'll call you back in just a few minutes, bring your refreshments back and the bishop will have some Q&A. Thank you for being here. Thank you.